Well, hello and welcome to the May 31st, 2020 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. I am Pastor Michael J. Matissek and once again welcome you to our YouTube channel and hope that this study is a blessing to you. If you're a regular attender of Christian Fellowship Church, you know that I've sent out sermon notes. And if you're visiting us and you're not a regular attender, I really encourage you to look at our website and check out our podcast. Definitely email us if you need any more information and come and visit us at 605 165th Street in Hammond someday. We'd love to get to meet you personally. Well, if you have a Bible, please open it to the book of James. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 12 is our study. This is our fifth and final study in this section of Scripture, and we'll be focusing on verses 9 to 12. This is a text about how to succeed in trials. If you have a sermon notes, that's the theme. It's right at the top. We're looking at how to succeed in trials. And if you look at verse 2, it ends with that various word that with the word various trials, the words various trials. And when we talk about trials, we're talking about tough times. We're talking about hardships. And trials are filled with bad news. How do you react when you get bad news? Two people can get the same bad news, but each person takes it differently. Why? Why is that? Well, I believe it's a matter of how they look at it. It's a matter of perspective. So how you look at things does matter. Here's a little joke on perspective. I like jokes. I like to tell you that I'm telling you a joke. because Sometimes my jokes aren't that good. I hope this is a good one. But here's a joke about perspective. An elderly lady was well known for her faith and for her boldness and talking about it. And she would stand on her front porch and, and scream out at times, Praise the Lord! Well, living next to her was an atheist. This atheist would get angry at her proclamations and he would shout back, There ain't no Lord! And obviously that set a tone of animosity between the two of them. Well, hard times came upon the lady one day and she prayed to God to send her some assistance. She stood on her porch and she yelled out, Praise the Lord! God, I need food. I'm having a hard time. Please, Lord, send some groceries. Well, the very next morning, the lady went out onto her porch, and voila, there was a large bag of groceries. And she shouted, Praise the Lord! Then, at that moment, her neighbor jumped out from behind the bushes and shouted, Ha ha! I told you that there was no Lord. I bought those groceries. God didn't. To which the lady started jumping up and down, all the more happier, clapping her hands and saying, Praise the Lord! He not only sent me the groceries, but he got the devil to buy them for me. Okay? So, little humor, definitely perspective. Well, for us as believers, God wants us to have his perspective on trials. He wants us to have his perspective on trials. Otherwise, Verse 2 makes no sense because remember, look at verse 2 as it started. Consider it all joy. Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Well, how can we have, we have joy? Well, we've got to have his perspective. We've got to have his perspective. How can I deal with a tragedy in this way? I've got to have God's perspective. And so, as I've been stating, this is a text of scripture that only believers can follow. And I'll make that even clearer as we get to the end of our study. Because believers have the Holy Spirit in them that will empower them to be able to do this. Doing this in your flesh, I believe you will have a struggle. You just can't do this and have the right perspective without the Holy Spirit giving you the ability to have that perspective. Now, it's not that we don't anguish over uh, bad news. I don't get the tragedy that someone I love has died and just like, oh, gleefully, oh, I'm just having joy. That's not the type of reaction that we're talking about. Even in the Bible, there are believers who get bad news. And what do they do? They rend their garments. They tear their garments to show the pain of the news. But at the same time, God does not want us as believers falling apart. We might rend the clothes, but we should never cry out, I can't go on, I can't live anymore, 
my life is over. Why is that? Because the Bible is clear. Passages, in many passages, but let's just take one, Colossians 3.3, 3, that talks about the fact that my life is hidden in Christ. What does that mean, that my life is hidden in Christ? Well, it means my future is secure. The very reality is that my future is bright no matter the bump in the road that I face. A believer's life is hidden with Christ. And so I challenge you, do you believe that? Now I tell you that you had better know what these instructions in James are, give, are teaching us. You need to follow them, you need to obey them because as a believer, as you've seen in our study, you will have trials. And as I've been going through this, this study, so many in our congregation have come up to me and said this is helpful because they're going through a trial. And the reality of it is, I think I can give this study next month, next year, in five years, and I would still get people coming up to me saying they're going through trials because we are always facing trials. And so what have we studied so far? Well, we have looked at the first three or four sets of instructions. And I call these sets of instructions is because each, each um, section of scripture is sort of like a set. It has one to three commands. It has some theology, it has some background information that all works together to give us an idea of how we are to respond. The very first one was just to have the general recognition that God is at work. That's what verses two and three are about when it says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The testing, the examination of what? Your faith. Well, to have a test, you have to have one who's giving the test. I call it a test tour. And in our study, we have said that God is the one that's giving the test. And so recognize God is at work. That this trial that you've fallen into isn't just an accident that might have appeared as a worldly accident, but God is very much in control. He knows that you are in this trial, but he's allowed it so that you can see that you have faith as well as to grow your faith. Second, we said the instruction is to commit to faithfulness. Verse 4, where it says, And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I, I think that's one of the most interesting commands in all of Scripture, that you are told to let something happen. You're to let this happen to you. And what is that? That is endurance is to control you. The idea of endurance is that you bear up under pressure. You bear up. The pressure doesn't get to you. You let it control you, the idea that you're holding up under the pressure. Hence, you're to commit to work towards faithfulness, to be complete, to be mature. And the idea of being mature is that all the parts are lacking. Are, are, are there. Nothing is lacking, to put it right away. So commit to faithfulness. And then the third set of instructions, which was a little bit longer, it had three different commands in it, a lot of theology, but basically it dealt with praying. And the third set of commands was that we were to pray for wisdom. As verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. And I said, you should throw... Yeah, run down the street, do cartwheels, have incredible joy recognizing that God is willing to give you whatever information you need. He'll give it to you gener generously. He will not give it out of reproach like, I told you so, I told you that you're no good, I told you that, that you, this would happen again. But he does warn us, if you don't ask, if you don't ask in faith, if you waver back and forth, you're acting like an unbeliever. <clears throat> and that is not good. Hence, there were two instructions that were given in verses 6 to 8 that were very, very um, um, concerning, very much a warning that you better make sure that you ask in the proper way. Well, as we come now to the fourth set of instructions, I want to recognize that we're going to come to verses 9 to 12. It's going to wrap up our study. But before we get there, let me just go back to verse 1 for a second. And, 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 and before we go back, I want to go, I mean, before we go forward, I want to go backwards. And so you might wonder why some of our studies take so long. It's because sometimes we do this, we go backwards. No, really, 
the reason I'm going backwards is we really didn't do an extensive um, study in the book of, um, well, for the book of James as a background book study. Those of you who know, we, we did this James study because we were going through this pandemic, the quarantine, and I've been hitting a section of sections of scripture that deal with trials. And so we sort of like camped on this James passage so that we could work through verses 2 to 12. But I never went back and actually did the background study. And I just wanted to point a few things out. We haven't even read verse 1 up to this study. And it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. That's a normal salutation for an epistle. This was the first book that was written to the New Testament church. I've already talked about the fact that James was the Lord's brother. He was um, one of the half-brothers. He became the leader in the church. But I wanted to point out that as we're looking at this book, that this book that is written about faith, that you have this man, James, who is considered a bond servant. It's his mindset. He is one who's going to serve. And I believe as he recognizes God's sovereignty, even his own brother's sovereignty, he's willing to do whatever he wants, meaning Jesus wants. He's willing to serve. And hey, I got to tell you, in doing a little background study for this study, I, a little theological side note, I found a, uh, um, a reference to the fact that James had a, a nickname. Now, I don't know if you had nicknames when you were growing up. Maybe some of you have a nickname now. When I was a kid, I really always wanted a nickname. Um, you have to ask me what my nickname was on the wrestling team. I, I thought my coach gave me a really nice one. I enjoyed it a lot. But um, I found out that James had a nickname. And I never knew this. And his nickname that church history has and church writings have is that he would, was called Old Camel Knees. Camel Knees. And you say, why is that a nice nickname? Well, because it was indicative of the fact that James would bend down like a camel and regularly pray. He was known as a man of prayer. And I think what a humble attitude, um, what a humble characteristic to have to be known as a man of prayer. He, you know, James could have been someone who was really arrogant, um, somebody who said and went around saying, look, you know, you have an important brother. Look at my brother, all right? Remember, they're half-brothers um, in the sense uh, that God was his father, Mary, his mother, same mother. James was a man of prayer, regularly coming to the Lord in prayer. But what I wanted to point out is when James writes to the 12 tribes, he's writing to Jewish Christians. We understand the, that they might have still known who some of the people from the different tribes were. That's why he would still call the 12 tribes, even though we would say, you know, the 10 lost tribes, the, those are never truly ever lost. Um, but I think there were still remnants of the different tribes in Jerusalem. But James is writing as the Jerusalem church is undergoing persecution. They're being scattered out of Jerusalem around the world. And so my point in bringing this up to you is that these people that James is writing to, called the dysphoria, people who have been scattered, they have lost not only their homes, but their families. In many cases, all aspects of society have been thrown out from them. They, they've lost it all. They can't go back to the societies they lived in. They, they are people that basically are under an extreme trial. And maybe that's why James also starts off right from the beginning. Let's talk about trials. And my point would be then if these instructions were good enough for them who were facing the most extreme situation where, again, many of them were being killed for their faith, these are clearly, clearly instructions good enough for you. And so with that idea, boy, you really have to understand this fourth one, this fourth set of instructions that we're going to find in verses 9 to 12. And it might surprise you, and I think this fourth set of instruction, a lot of professing Christians don't really get into the depth. They don't study verse by verse, and they miss this. And I don't want us to miss this, so please pay attention. Um, let me just read verses 9 to 12. As James is moving through, he says this in verse 9, But the brother of humble circumstances is the glory in his high position, and the rich man is the glory in his humiliation, because like the flowering grass, he will pass away. Verse 11, 
For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Here it is. If you have your sermon notes, fill in the blank with the word accept. Accept your situation. A-C-C-E-P-T. Accept your situation. Meaning, receive it. Grasp it. Come to the point where you're going to realize that you have to live with it. There are two sets of commands in this section. Um, one is explicit. It's an interesting use of uh, how you write in Greek. Sometimes you would say one explicit verb, and then just by um, the way that you write, you implicitly uh, you imply that it's used again. So the command is in verse nine, glory. Okay, and it goes to the brother of humble circumstances. And then by repeating the, 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 uh, the, the very same structure, like sort of like we call it a parallel structure in verse 10, it says the rich man, and then by implication is the glory. So I'm just saying there are two more commands. You have a rich man who's the glory, and you have a brother of humble circumstances is the glory. And, and obviously we're going to get into that. We're going to get into the details. So to accept it means that you don't get upset. You rejoice just like God says. And the verb to glory is a word that we often associate with God, right? I'm going to give God glory. I'm going to glorify God. Well, here I'm glorifying the situation. Well, there is a dynamic, an aspect of this verb glory that I think, I, when I was looking at it, has a sense of having joy. And I truly believe that James, when he was writing, was trying to give us a synonym to the concept of rejoicing. And, and there's a sense where there's a sense where there's a settled peace and elation that as you go through a tragedy that you're recognizing that God is at work. Hence, this last command is really trying to drive home how well you accept your position. And there are two extremes, the humble position and the rich position. And he's going to tell us no matter where we are in life, we need to accept it. We need to glorify it. Um, in the sense that we stay, we go through a, a sense of having a sense of rejoicing, okay? When we do this, and we're going to get into the details, you accept how your life is. You will take, it will take a lot of faith, but remember, that's what this book is about, trying to teach you about faith. Faith is a trust. And when we trust in doctrine, this is a really key point. You know, we trust in doctrine. We have doctrine like the plan of salvation, that we're sinners, that Jesus is God and man, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and that by faith alone, we can have eternal life. That's the doctrine that we believe in. We have that faith. But we also trust in the implication of God's character. We have passages that talk about God is good. Old Testament and New Testament teach about God being good. That's his very character. And so if the Bible teaches God is good, and it does, then I have to trust in that doctrine too. And that will help me as an underlying principle when I face a tragedy, a tragedy that I'm not happy about. you know. And, and so I have to trust in my situation that God is good. And so you see, this is about perspective how you view things, and it takes faith to trust. It might be an old illustration, but in looking at a glass of water half filled, we say the pessimist says it's half empty, but the optimist says it is half full. Well, look, there is a Christian perspective, and God does not want us so much looking at the glass being half this or half that, in the sense that that we look at the glass and say, one day I know my cup's going to run over. Okay? It, it, it's the idea that no matter where we're at in the glass, it can be a quarter filled. I know that one day it's going to be completely filled. And I have to recognize that. And so when I recognize from the perspective of where I'm going to end up, I can recognize that I can accept where I am now. Because this is only a temporary state. So... Look, verses 9 to 10. 
where James says, but the brother of humble circumstances, the glory in his high position, and the rich man is the glory in his humiliation. Let's break that down. What James is talking about is, um, let's contrast now a faithful believer with the unfaithful believer. Because he was talking about the unfaithful, uh, the unfaithful professing believer in verses 7 and 8. So that's why you got the word but. But we're going to contrast it. And now he turns to discussing the brethren. And so the brother, the brother is a reference to one that would be in the family of God. And he gives one long sentence that runs through two verses. And he uses a form of literally of, of, of writing where the first verb is implied in the second. I, I, I went through this. But the idea is to glorify God. Like you glorify him when you worship him. When, and even in a joke when that woman said, I praise God. So... Look at how we start. The first person is in a lowly position. And he's called a brother of humble circumstances. Humble, lowly. And I, you know, it's not a wealthy person. It might be a person who's lost all his health. He's just in a bad situation. But it really emphasizes the economic situation more so. The idea that he's not in the best position. He's gone through some type of tragedy. And, and look what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to sort of like rejoice in his high position. And you say, wait a second, how could uh, a, a low person have a high position? Well, I'm going to explain that in a second. But that's where you've got that contrast. You've got him positionally, you know, from where we would look at him economically, you say, well, gosh, this guy is in a bad situation. But God is saying, no, you've got a better perspective. You've got to look at it. It's a high position from my perspective. Whereas then you come in to the second person, he is in a good place financially and perhaps even health-wise, but now he has to look at the implication of his trial and to see that it's brought him low because the rich man is the glory in his humiliation. And the idea of humiliation is that something has happened to him and he can't, he, he can't no longer just consider that life is all easy and, and that life has brought him low. And so then we get this illustration of the fact that it's, he's like the flowering grass, he will pass away. And, and you think, well, are we talking about flowers or are we talking about grass? Well, in Israel, they have these grass that produce flowers. So I just point that out. And so in verse 11, it gets even more elaborate. So in verse 11, the concept is given more details. And I believe what James is trying to do is trying to just make it all the clear. As he brings up an Old Testament concept, I believe it's from the book of Isaiah, and he says, For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So the idea is that, you know, you've got this grass, it's beautiful, but over time, you know, as the season goes on, as the summer goes on, the grass can't make it through it, doesn't get all the water it needs, it, and, and eventually its season comes and it ends. And well, this is something that we all know, right? I you know, basically... Um, Flowers don't last forever. And we just recently had that at, 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 at our house. We have the spring flowers that are coming on the trees. And they're absolutely gorgeous. And Becky was working on getting our awnings up. And she was so concerned that we could get our awnings up on our house when the flowers were blooming. Because she knew that if we didn't get the awnings up in time, the picture that she wanted for our house wouldn't be complete. <clears throat> that um, those flowers were going to die shortly. Well, I don't want to be morbid here, but when a believer sees death coming, you know, it, it's a certainty. We're all going to die. And when we see that we're coming to death's door, I think it's very important that we recognize it's sort of like a revolving door. We're just going to keep on going. We don't come to death and then go through a door and then it ends for us. No, we go and we revolve and we come out the other side a new creature. When I was a kid, I used to love the uh, Superman TV shows and there were Superman movies and Superman would often change in a phone booth. But when he couldn't get into a phone booth, and I'm talking the old type of phone booths where it was like he, he could go in and I don't know why, you could always see in it, but it would be, pretend like he, he couldn't be seen and he would change into... Um, from Clark Kent into a Superman uniform, but sometimes he would go into a revolving door and he would spin that thing around and next thing you know, it would go so fast and before you know it, he transformed out of his Clark Kent suit 
into a Superman outfit. Well, I want us to think when we face death's door, we're going to go through a revolving door and we're going to spin around, we're going to come out the other side and we're going to be in our glorified body. We never go to a point where we're, we, we cease to be. And a great passage for you all as believers, just to remind you of this truth, is 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. It's, it's a passage that's talking about love, but he brings in this theological point. And he says this, John says, We know we've passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. And, and he does not love abides in death because an unbeliever is dead. And believers are contrasted to them. We live and we love and we are now passed into life it's secure meaning we are never going to have a spiritual death we're never going to face that type of judgment it is secure for us we are alive forever we have eternal life and so as believers we don't have to fear death and that's why trials don't have to bring us to despair we have faith in god and so you look at this and you have a rich man who is looking at his position and what has happened to him is that tragedy and hardship is coming upon him and where he thought he had everything going for him, he now realizes this tragedy has come into his life and even if he's a believer and he's now brought low, he's humbled. Now, I know um, unbelievers, they fear death and I have ran across a great story this week and 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 it's a great illustration. Jake Paul Getty, um, Getty Museum out in California, one of the most incredible museums that you'll ever go to. One of the richest men ever that the world has ever seen. And he was someone that had his giant mansion. And prior to his death, the story that I ran across this week said that as he was facing his death, his health was declining. He knew he was going to die. He ended up starting calling up people all over the world, doctors, scientists, how could he prolong his life? He was even offering up to a half of his fortune. Can someone keep me alive? But the reality is they couldn't. And he died, I believe, a very lonely man. And he ended up um, unable to stop death from coming. And so like a flower, all right, that has only got its season, even the rich man, like a J. Paul Getty, only has a short amount of time on this earth. You can't stop death from coming. And, and hence, you can't stop trials from coming. So even if you went through all of life with very little trials, you're going to get the ultimate trial, death, that you're going to face. And so you have to what? Accept your situation and realize from the perspective of God that nothing is permanent. Like grass, that flowers, it will not stay around forever. Well, what about this position, let's go back to the brother of humble circumstances. How is his considered a high position? And I believe what James is referring to is something that he's going to allude to more in chapter 2. And that's the fact that people that struggle economically and deal with financial positions that, that, that are hard have a blessing from God. So if you jump over to James chapter 2, let me just illustrate it or explain it. Um, in James chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, James is talking about how important it is that our faith is evidenced by being impartial, that we don't just show preference to rich people. So he says this in verse 1, My brethren, don't hold your, what, your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes to your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Evil motives, I'm going to get something from this guy. Maybe he'll like me. Maybe he'll give me some money, etc. That is how... We are not to act. We are not to have personal favoritism. Well, what does this have to do with being a high position? Well, look at the next verse. Listen, my beloved brethren, verse 5 says, Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? You catch that? Those who love him. That's going to come at the end of verse 12 in chapter 1 as well. But the idea is, what do you mean God chose? God chose the poor of the world to be rich in faith. Well, I believe God is using the practical reality 
uh, in this doctrine of election and the doctrine of who he's going to bless of poor people uh, and the fact that poor people are people who realize there's nothing that they're holding on to in this world. I mean, even the Proverbs talks about how uh, for a rich man that his wealth is sort of like his ransom. It's, it's everything to him. And, and what a poor man does is say, you got to be kidding me. I'm going to die? Well, good. I'm going to leave this earth. I I'm not going to live for the things of this earth. I'm not working and worrying about accumulating things and preserving all my wealth and making sure that, that I have all this wealth um, amassed. Because I don't have anything. And I don't have anything, I'm not going to expound upon it. And so because people have this perspective, they are more going to, you know, live for God. Um, it's harder to get a, a rich man through the, the Ivan, you know, the, it's harder to get a rich man through the Ivan Neal than a camel, right? Is that sort of how it goes? <laughs> You're going to have to tell me that. I'm doing off the top of my head. But the idea is that rich people will often have a tendency to live for this world. And we're going to get in later into the, if you do your own reading on James chapter 5, he talks about just where so many rich people are. They're living for this world. So what we need to recognize is that when we go back to verse 9, the brother of humble circumstances is the glory in his high position. Whatever trial you have and you look at your life and you say, look, I'm really in a bad situation and I've, I've struggled through this situation and it's really got me really low. The reality of it is, is it gives you a better perspective on that the fact that this is a cursed world, that this world isn't right, that it's not permanent, that we need Jesus Christ to return, to redeem the world, to make the world better. And in the meantime, while we're all waiting for that, I can go to heaven. And, and so that lowly position keeps me focused and it is a higher position because it, I believe the people who recognize this are, are far better servants, far more living for God, serving God. And it's not that you can't be wealthy and be a Christian. I got that. But it's always going to be a battle for people who have money and they're Christians. It, it's just, it's true. And, and we look at it from a world's perspective, this is why the pharaohs built their tombs, right? Because they always wanted to keep their wealth. They want to make sure they always have their stuff. And that's why when they built their tombs, their pyramids, that they hoped that they would resurrect. And next thing you know, all their wealth would be around them. And obviously that never came true. Most of it's in museums because people stole it. And so we watched the, we watched the reality of the fact that a rich man comes to a position where he recognizes he too is going to die. He's going to be humiliated. He's going to end up laying in a casket just like the poor man. And you can't take anything with you. You can't. And, and so accept your position. And so you go through a tragedy, you go through a hardship, and you say, all is lost. No, it's not. Because if you've been storing up your treasure in heaven, nothing that you stored up is lost. That's the concept. That's the idea. And so when you come then to verse 12, it says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Look, this is one last statement in this whole section of trials. And the idea of being blessed is the fact that this is a person that is happy. He's in a good position. He's got the right perspective view. He's looking at things because he's happy and he's endured. Look at, blessed is a man who perseveres. What is the word persevere? It's the exact same Greek word that we saw back in verses 3 and 4 that uh, dealing with endurance. It, I, you know, he literally could have been translated, blessed is the man who endures under trial, under the pressure, the ongoing, and it's a present tense. This man is in a good position. Now, the blessed man, I always think of Psalm 1. Um, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers. He's blessed because he, he's fixated on God and God's word. And this is the very same person to me because he's a person that has the right perspective. He's bared up under trials. He's, he's, he's followed all the instructions. He's recognized guys at work. He's committed to being faithful. He's asked for wisdom and he's implemented it. And so he is going to be going to be always in a good position. 
And when he gets to the end of his life, look what it says. For when he is approved. And you know what that word approved is a synonym to? Synonym to? Back in verse 3. The idea of tested. In verse 3 it said, knowing that the testing of your faith. Well, the idea here is tested and approved. It, it's a synonym for it. It's the idea that it's passed the test. And I use the illustration of, you know, you put like some type of acid on gold to determine if it was truly genuinely gold. And, 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 and in essence, God has put this under on you and tested whether you are true gold or not. And you've come out approved. Blessed is the man who makes it to the end. He's faithful. He's been approved. And he will receive this crown, the Stephanos crown, the victor's crown. It's a crown of life. And there's a lot of debate exactly how and what it will look like, but I do know when you do this study of crowns and you struggle on trying to define them, I think one of the biggest emphasize, emphasis is, is how is that crown defined? It's life. And, and, and yes, maybe somebody gets more reward than others, and I think that is a, a truism, but I think there's an aspect that it's going to deal with the fact that we who are believers are going to have the blessing, the crown, that is life. We're going to have life in its fullest. We're going to have life as the way it's supposed to be. We're going to be complete. We're going to be people that have all the characteristics of God that we're supposed to have. And, and it, this entire process, we'll be so thankful because we'll see that God has been working to give us the right perspective through the entire lifetime that he's given us. And again, some people are given 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Each one of you are going to be given different time periods. But I got to tell you that each of you, each of you, that God knows what you're supposed to go through and you're supposed to have the perspective, okay, my life isn't by chance. So let me just wrap up. If I'm going to have faith, I think there's two important concepts that I've kind of alluded to, and I just wanted to give you two verses to deal with each of these concepts, two verses theologically that I think really help us as believers. And I hope that you will always have these because as you recognize, you see at the end of verse 12, it talks about God has promised these things to those who love him. People who love him. He doesn't say have faith in him at that point because when we turn to God, we turn and believe that, that you know, Jesus died for us and there's a sense where we have a relationship with God and we fall in love with Jesus and we love his ways. And so we've been given promises of eternal life. And we've been given promises at future things. A very nature of a promise is that it relates to the future. All right? So if I am a person that loves God, I need to recognize two things as I go through trials. Number one, I've got to recognize God is sovereign. And I'm asking if you'll graciously turn back to the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Um, Isaiah has 66 chapters. 39, the first 39 deal with God's judgment and then on Israel and they're, they're unfaithful. It's, Isaiah's writing around the year 726 to 680 BC. And as he's bringing, as he's writing about the judgments that are, that are coming upon the people, coming on the northern tribes as well as the southern tribes, he stops at verse uh, chapter 40 and begins talking about the coming Messiah and the incredible blessings and the way he's going to restore Israel and so that the people understand that he can do this he does talk about this concept of sovereignty and Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 let me get there myself Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 goes all the way this section goes all the way to verse 26 where we learn how how powerful God is and so, look at, as Isaiah writes about God, and he says this in verse 12, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? And the implication is that no one has. And you see, I'm talking about sovereignty here because when you go through a trial there's always the pressure couldn't God have stopped this why did God allow this and we must always have the perspective that we know God could have stopped whatever tragedy we know God could have prevented some very horrible event from happening 
He could have. But if he's allowed it, my perspective must always be that the sovereign God has done it because he is good. And so as it goes on, when he says in verse 14, with whom did he consult and who gave him understanding and who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and formed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman cast it, and a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fa fashions chains of silver. He is too impoverished for such an offering. He selects a tree that does not rot. He, he seeks out for himself a skilled craftsman to prepare an idol that will not rotter. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and inhabitants are like grasshoppers. We, humbly, are like grasshoppers before God. And he goes on in verse 22, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. You see, God is sovereign. He's sovereign over the rulers. He's sovereign over your life too. Scarcely have they been planted. Scarcely have they been sown. Scarcely has their rock taken root in uh, uh, stock. Has take, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth. He merely blows on, on them and they wither. And the storm carries them away like stubble. Like the very illustration that we dealt with in James. Like the flowering grass. It goes through the summer. It goes through the season. Then it's gone. These rulers that think that they're great. These people who have ruled the world. That thought they are going to rule forever. They're not. Whether it's the pharaohs or the kings of the world. Or the presidents. Nobody lasts forever. And so, verse 25, To whom then will you liken me, that I would be as equal, says the Lord, the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. None of them is missing. God is sovereign. He's controlling all the stars. Cannot God control your life too? Absolutely. So this is why you must have this fit into your perspective. This is why whatever you, happens to you, you must be able to say, I have the mindset that I recognize whether I'm in a high position or a low position, God is ultimately going to take care of me. And if I am humbled and I die, I, I, you know, I've got a future. And if I'm rich and I'm a believer and I lose everything in death, it's not the end of me because I have a future. What matters is my relationship with Jesus Christ, have I stored everything up? And so how important it is that we recognize that God is sovereign. And then second, I wanted to just leave you with this position. Look, turn to the book of John, the gospel of John. Last night of Christ's life, John 14, the, Jesus recognizes that we're going to have trials. He tells his disciples that we're going to have difficulties. And not only the 11 disciples that are with him at night, but the ongoing disciples who keep adding to the church, that which are you and I. And in John chapter 14, okay, John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18, he says this. As he is talking to his disciples, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is, he tells us who it is explicitly in verse 17. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And he lives inside us through the Holy Spirit. So listen to me. You must remember the truth of the matter is that when you're told, accept your situation, as well as all of these other sets of instructions, the reason you can do it is because you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And a believer in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit in them. The person that goes through a trial and falls apart, the person that reacts and says, I can't do it. I can't go on. I find this is the end of my life. This is the person that I've got to wonder, do they have this power in them? Do they have the Holy Spirit in them? And so as we wrap this trial up, uh, the study of trials up, I ask you once again, how do you react in trials? 
because how you react is very important. Focusing on that last command, will you accept what God has for you, no matter what position you're in, whether you're rich or you're poor? Because the end for all of us is death. And as I conclude our entire study, I've got an application story for you, and I really want to drive home the fact that you have to follow all of these instructions, recognize God is at work, commit to faithfulness, pray for wisdom, accept your situation. Because no matter what you're going to face, this is the way God wants you to react. He wants you to recognize that he who is your father in heaven is in absolute control. And this is why we have a religion that we call a personal relationship. A personal relationship with God. So let me give you an illustration of a father who has a personal relationship with his own child. Okay? And I, I have two children. I have a son. I have a daughter. And each of them are different. And when I raise my children, I, I recognize that each of them are different. They're different than one another. And in many cases, because they are different, I treat them different. I don't do that always, but there are times I do. I do treat them, and I have my reasons. Age, experience, obedience, trust factors are all things that I, as a father, Mike Matissek, take into consideration. And I want to say this. I think I know my kids, just like other parents know their kids, loving parents who know their kids. And I would hope that I would be considered a, a loving parent. And as a parent, you know, I don't always get excited when someone says to me, well, I wouldn't have done that with my kids. And maybe some of you get a little irritated with that as well. I wouldn't have done that with my kids. Well, I say, great. <laughs> Thankfully, this isn't your kid. I've got my kid and I know my kid. And this is what we've gone through over the last 24 hours. I know what we've gone over in the last 24 hours, or the last seven days, last month, are all the days of his life, all the days of her life. I've been with them the entire time. I know what my child needs to do. And I want to relate this because our Father in Heaven is the same. We have a relationship with Him. He knows everything that we've been through. Well, Here's an illustration of a father dealing with a six-year-old. Suppose a father is out to a store and he, his child wants a candy bar. The candy bar is one dollar and the child really wants it. And the child reaches into his pocket and he counts his money and he has 95 cents. He is a nickel short. He's standing there with his father and he starts to cry. He's frustrated. Here's five ways that this could all play out. <clears throat> Number one, as a father, I hope he asks me for that nickel. I'm not going to offer it. I want him to learn to ask me for things because I want to teach him to also learn to ask God. Okay? I know my son. I know my daughter. And if it was either one of them, this is something they have to learn. I've got a lot of nickels. I have the resources. I want them to ask. You look at James chapter 1, verse 5. What does it say? But if any of you lacks wisdom, ask. God says, ask. So the child needs a nickel. Instead of me just offering it, I want him to ask. Or, second, even if he asks me for it, I'm going to say no. Wait a second. Why are you going to say no? Why? Because one hour earlier, maybe unbeknownst to you, he bought something with that nickel that when he had a full dollar that I told him was a waste of money and it was a waste of money. I told him to save his money because he, there might be something later that he's really going to want, but he didn't listen to me. And so now I'm not going to give him that nickel. I'm going to teach him there are consequences for wasteful spending. If he really wants that candy bar, he's going to have to come back another day. He's got a lesson to learn. He's going to have to learn maybe to save and use his money better. Third, here's another illustration. Oh, and just on that one, it's the same thing. God can recognize sometimes there's a lesson that we've got to learn, that we've been wasting our time, wasting our efforts. He's going to take us through lessons. Third, even if the child asks for it, I'm going to say no again. Why? Because I want him to go to bed hungry. I have several reasons here. One, I, I know a worker's hunger drives him on. And sometimes a child, if he realizes, boy, to get that nickel, it just not everything's going to be handed to me. I have to work. I want that to be a lesson that he gets. And then as a fourth illustration, I might not give it to him because I want him to realize there are people all over the world in this fallen world that go to bed hungry. 
that they want something, they can't get it because it's a cursed world. And hopefully he'll realize in a deep way why we talk so much about the gospel of Jesus Christ and why we need to get people saved and why we not, need not to live for this world because it's a poor world. Now, I'm not going to send my kid always to bed hungry, but obviously understand, I think there are times that God has us go through trials so that we understand this is a cursed world. And fifth and finally, if he asks, I might buy that candy bar, but give it to him tomorrow because I want him uh, not to eat it today because he's already had enough sweets. I want to provide everything for my child. But I also realize that he's had treats from his mother, maybe his grandmother, his grandfather, and it's just not the right timing. He would have too many sweets that day. So, yeah, I'll buy you that candy bar. I'll give you the nickel, but I'm going to take it. I don't want you to get sick. I'm going to give it to you another day. Just like God recognizes, I pray for something today, and I don't get it, but maybe I get it in a year. I get it in five years. Because God's timing is always perfect. Well, I can go on. We, we have a Heavenly Father that all of us know individually. And there's a reason you're going to go through the trials that you're going to go through. And I'm going to go through the trials that I'm going to go through. But no matter what I go through, I've got to trust, and you've got to trust, that God knows what you're going through. Look at those five instructions. Go back to this. Over and over and over. This is a passage of scripture that every believer needs to know like the back of their hand. They need to know they, they have to recognize God's at work. They need to commit to faithfulness, pray for wisdom, and accept their situation. And when they do that, their faith will be proven. Their faith will be shown. They'll have confidence they're truly born again. They'll be a testimony to the world. And if you go through the trial and you fail, you pick yourself back up. But if you don't pick yourself back up, don't lie to yourself and say, oh, I'm fine. I'm a born-again believer. Because God is talking about testing people if they have genuine faith or not. My hope is that we all have genuine faith. God bless.